everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Data Centre Exchange. Uh, today I'm joined by a man who has a unique background. He's a seasoned industry leader within the data centre industry. He's an ex-sub commander and I would also say he's a data centre influencer as well. Um, if you're active on LinkedIn and following various people within the data centre world, I'm sure you would have seen various posts and videos, all very fascinating stuff. And he's somebody who's had an imp a, a very impressive and diverse background, as I say, met 20 years in the military, I believe, through to where he is now, which is the general manager of Compass Quantum. So this is a truly fascinating modular data center solution with some phenomenal features. And I'm really, really keen to dig into a bit of that and also the man himself. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Tony Grayson to the Data Center Exchange. Um, Tony, thanks for joining us. No, thank, thank you. And thanks for the great intro. And thanks for <laughs> having me. No problem at all. Thanks for coming on. Um, we always start these with the background of the individual. And, and as I said in the intro, yours is, is fascinating. So could you give the listeners the background from sort of, you know, the very early years of your career? And I, I believe that was the, the sort of military up until the point where you entered the data center industry. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I, I had a super different path to tech. And so you know, it really was 20 years in the military. Um, my life goal was at that time, you know, to command a submarine. Um, and so I did that. And, you know, for those four years, though, I was probably out to sea 70, 80% of the time. And so, you know, you kind of get to a point where you hit your life goal. You also hit pension time in the military and you get health care the rest of your life. And, uh, and you want to spend more time with your family. So I chose to, you know, you know, call it quits after 20 years, pretty much right after my command tour, and then tried out the public sector. And, and, you know, I consider myself super, super fortunate where, you know, there were, this was the time when, when nuke, nukes like myself were starting to, I'll say, infiltrate the data center community. Um, and so I was originally hired for at uh, Facebook, and we were talking about being the EMEA facility lead. But it turns out uh, I kind of you kind of know how cloud works on a submarine. Uh, a cloud works because of a submarine because you really have about ten to fifteen megawatts of IT load. You know, it's just everything's called different. It's not called a substrate or an overlay or anything like that. Now you know networking is called something different. You kind of understand how it works because I mean that's how really how a submarine works and everything's tied together. So you know I kind of applied that at Facebook and I was kind of got more into the you know, kind of ISP, OSP, fiber networking side at Facebook. Um, absolutely love Facebook. It was a great transition piece. You know, I, I learned a lot of lessons. Like I think I would have, I don't know if I would have done as well if I did, it, saying I did well, but um, anything else other than Facebook, because they were like, uh, don't do anything for six months. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? Don't do anything for six months. You know, I'm ready to go now. I've seen these problems before, but, you know, it, the military, it, despite what I thought at that time, the military is super, super different in everything than the civilian world. Leadership, program management, budget, product, you name it, 100% different. So just learning that six months and giving the opportunity just to be an IC really, um, really helped me set me up for success because I kind of learned how I did it before I stuck my foot in my mouth and made some stupid mistakes. Um, and so spent uh, you know two years at AWS, Love data, or sorry, at Microsoft, or <laughs> going all through them now uh, at Facebook. Um, but in the in the end, Bayer was just too expensive. You know, the military does not pay much. This is a time in you know 2016, 2017, where you know 20 year olds were paying in cash in California with all their their stocks and everything and buying homes, and we just couldn't afford it. So ended up moving. My family moved up to uh, Seattle, and I was flying the nerd bird down. So. You know, I'd fly down in the morning on on Monday morning and fly back on Thursday with the same people on an Alaska flight. Um, and, but it was just kind of, this is why I left the military. It was just, you know, was really to spend more time with my family. So I switched over to AWS. Uh, AWS was doing, you know, kind of starting up a new group inside of ATS for kind of uh, interior, you know, kind of architecture. Um, but then I had an opportunity to jump over to Oracle and do something I hadn't done before, which was run their network and then, Loved Oracle. Well, eventually, I picked up, you know, kind of their strategy side, their data center side, and and really learned a, a ton there. Um, during that time at Oracle, I kind of, you know, we had a thing called dedicated regions, which you know I worked a lot on, which is basically take the cloud to a region. And I had this idea of Oracle in a box, but 
you know, at that time they really didn't want to do it, but I saw the value because I was seeing, you know, enterprise customers couldn't house as many racks that were needed or they couldn't house the density. So my idea was, well, I'll just bring, I'll bring the data center to them. Why not? Um, so everyone loved the idea, but we just didn't want to do it then, but I did see the value of it. And so lucky enough, you know, Chris Cross was one of my mentors and was helping me out and said, well, I have this company called Edge Point. Why don't you come on over and, and get it going and, and get it started and, and, you know, do it as an incubated startup. So startup, totally cheating. Don't have to worry about raising money. Don't have to worry about salary. Have great people around me who can tell me I'm an idiot uh, and give me recommendations um, and really provide me support and as I kind of build the company. Amazing. Just out of interest, how did Chris become your mentor? At what point I don't, in that I, journey? No, I, I was buying from Chris. Okay. Um, Chris was one of those people that when you talk to him, he was like a he was like a, a no BS kind of person and, you know, obviously super intelligent and, and got it. And so it was just interesting to, you know, ask him kinds of questions about the industry because he's been there forever. You know, he's there at the beginning of DRT and everything. So it was just great to answer some questions that I had other people too, you know, like Surreal from Vantage or Randy from um, Edge Connects or Hussein from Cloud HQ. So, you know, or Brian from Stack. There, there, I had a lot of them out there, but it was just... Uh, you know, Chris had the opportunity and said, why don't you come on over and try it? Very nice. So you're at, so Compass Quantum, give give us a little bit of an insight into, into what you guys are doing and what the solution is you're offering. Because most of the guests we've had thus far on, on the Data Center Exchange have been from the sort of hyperscale world, but I know it's, it's an entirely different solution. Yeah, I think, you know, and I have a, I mean, I guess I have a different view of the future. I don't know if it's different than most or anything, but you know, I really believe, and this is kind of what, you know, Oracle had taught me where, you know, as latency becomes more of an issue, as, you know, security, privacy, you know, any kind of, uh, any kind of certifications that you have, things will move closer to the customer. They have to move closer to the customer. I mean, there's, there's network transport costs, there's all these other things that kind of go into it. And so really the network it's going to be the center stage for everything and and not just necessarily the network, but the on-ramp and peering points because, you know, no one, I don't think is going to be one cloud. They're going to be hybrid cloud because there's great things that Oracle does. There's great things that AWS does. There's great things that Azure does. Same thing with Google Cloud and everything. So if, I, if I'm really building my own company and I'm using the cloud, I'm going to switch between clouds. So that peering point, on-ramp point will start to become the center of the universe. Um, but you will have, you will have this, it's almost the second spoke now move an aggregation point that's closer to the customer. And that's for stuff that needs to have compute closer to the customer. Um, and that could be IOT. It could be some of these new platforms that are kind of coming out. Um, but just think stuff that has to be latency sensitive or stuff that could be high network bandwidth costs. Um, and so what I really wanted to do was, you know, what we were, what we're trying to do is, is make that aggregation point easier, but also that aggregation point will spoke out into things that need to front haul to that aggregation point. So we're just trying to provide someone under an OPEX, you know, MRR function, a, a full service hyperscale like modular data center that you can put on-prem, near-prem, I and mean, it can go on your roof, it can go in your garage, it can go in parking spots, or it could be in the middle of nowhere. I don't really care where it goes. It's really meant to go anywhere. Um, and we'll give you you know, enough positions of standard compute or HPC for you to run it, but you also have the resiliency of a hyperscale data center with true, you know, two end performance. I, I think that, you know, in the past, what people have been doing is, you know, the edge has been seen as kind of just something that's out there. And so it's not really resilient. And, you know, the data center community, you always hear this where, well, it's, it's on the platform. The platform makes the decisions to make your own self resilient. So, you know, it's almost like, you know, what, you know, we're just trying not to do it where we sacrifice any of that kind of stuff, where it is a true two end, because, you know, you can sit there and say, you know, you're, we're multi, you know, kind of, um, you can take a, some stuff down and do maintenance, you know, in there. But if you're single source through your switch gear and your UPS, I mean, how do you do switch gear cleaning and specs? I mean, you're, yes, you're concurrently maintainable in some things, but not everything. And I just, you know, I have this fear of spoffs because I think it, you know, it's going to bite you at some time. And if you really have hundreds or thousands of these things, you really want to be worried all the spoffs. So 
So we're trying to make it all that easy where we will manufacture, we'll deploy, we'll run it for a customer on our MRR, uh, wherever they want it. So long-winded answer to your question. Um, but I'm having the fun of my life. It's, you know, it's, I've been able to delve into this stuff like material science and mass customization and manufacturing and all those cool things that we're doing. And, you know, eventually I think we, you know, we are starting to go into more of the HPC stuff too. So, you know, giving HPC nodes are totally not latency sensitive, but you know, they have to be able to go anywhere. So we're starting to get into that too. Nice. And, and these are manufactured, aren't they? Not constructed. So oh yeah, they're manufactured. And so, you know, one of the things I, yeah. what I looked at when I was at Oracle, when I was looking at, you know, kind of these modules is, you know, the, really a lot of the mon modules at that time, at least that I had saw, were basically stick built in a warehouse where you have a bunch of people swarming it. I mean, there's a reason why we see, I'm a, I'm a car person. There's a reason why cars aren't built being swarmed. I mean, there's Bugattis, but they're 2 million bucks or they're, you can look back to the UK and the, you know, 80s with Triumph and everything where, where they were hand built, which means they, they sucked because there was no quality control and, you know, you were dealing with that kind of stuff. So we really wanted to build ours in our production line where we have a certain amount of stations, you know, where managers and QA come down, the workers have all that worker, you know, all their tools right there. They don't have to go wandering off for things. And it really makes, to me, a better product because you get it through quicker. It ends up being cheaper, but you have a higher quality because people are doing the same things every single time. And they they learn from those things as, as it goes through the production cycle. So you know, that's a, kind of what we're doing is, is definitely more of a manufactured approach. But you know, we're also mass customizing where I'm not trying to do a bespoke build. You know, we're a little bit different. I, I will let you change things to customize your module to suit you, but you can't change everything. You have a list of options because that allows me to pre-buy. That allows me, you know, to take the design out of it because we've already done that part of it, but I've also tested all this stuff. So you get a, a better product faster that is, you know, in my respect, you know, the, a little bit cheaper than you trying to do a bespoke build um, from the ground up. And there's nothing wrong with bespoke builds and I get the need for it. But if you're really trying to do hundreds of these things, like I think it's going to happen in the end for deploying some of this infrastructure, then you 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 can't do it like this, uh, a bespoke build every single time. Yeah. And as you say there, the the speed the, that you can deliver these um, solutions, just just how quickly and, and, and I mean, how much of a sort of USP is that for you guys? I mean, I think once you get the supply chain going where you have, and it really comes down to mechanical electrical, when you have that showing up on time, then you can build these things in weeks because it's very standardized and our design is a little bit different. You know, we use a composite, so we really get away from welding. We just bolt or bond everything together, which is it's actually really makes it a lot easier to assemble and everything. Um, so we can, you know, get these in weeks. Um, assuming we have all the pieces and parts and, and get it done. So you know, that's really what it's kind of to do is, you know, my thought is really it's if I am a, a provider, why am I gonna buy excess space that I can't use? Why not just have just in time delivery? You know, we we always laugh that why can't I just go into Amazon and say, Hey, I need a I, I need this in 90 days and just had an ad and you can get your little update that your, your little data center is being delivered to you or that kind of stuff. There's no reason we can't do something like that. You know, and it is a very different concept than these hyperscale builds. And, and it's just a different frame of reference because no one's going to buy thousands of hyperscale builds, but they will buy thousands of these kind of modular units. I mean, go look at how many telecom huts are around the world, you know, tens of thousands of them. Um, so that's kind of the way, at least the way we're approaching it. No, that's interesting. And you said earlier that these can be deployed anywhere. Um, and the durability and the security of them is something that I know, you know, has been, I've seen on LinkedIn several times, but for those that haven't seen that, just, just how durable are these things and where could they be deployed? I've heard battlefields, for example, could, yeah. you know, in theory. Yeah. So, I mean, they are, so we make out of composite, you know, the real things that we're trying to go after was, you know, starting with being more sustainable. Um, and, you know, if you look at steel and concrete, they're not the most sustainable things in the world. So we want to be, we wanted to build something more sustainable. So we, you know, working with Owens Corning, there's a composite out there that we were using that was being used for, you know, originally was born out of early 2000s for the military, really for, you know, mortar protection and spalling protection or fragment protection. So companies have been using that to 
you know, build walkways or, you know, build homes. I mean, there's bulletproof homes you can build out of this stuff and everything. So we just wanted to, it's definitely a, a, a it's not something new. We are just kind of dusted off and put in a new application. So, you know, the sustainability aspect, we know we save roughly, I think it's like 80 to 90 tons of carbon compared to a steel structure, but the thing is a hundred percent reusable. So, you know, I've, I've seen the, I show videos on there where we suck up the gas and we're CNC in this thing and we, reuse all that stuff and it would a different brick. And then um, at end of life, you could actually recycle the thing too. Um, so that's kind of takes care of sustainability. I mean, and the thing will last forever. I mean, it's no different than some of those other composites out there. It doesn't degrade in the sun. You don't have pest problems. You don't have all the stuff. So we're talking a TCO life of a shell of, you know, hundreds of years, as opposed to a set of 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so the TCO is a little bit different too on the longevity um, strength. It can handle, you know, any wind load you want, but it is certified for, you know, for the state of Florida to be a category five storm shelter. Um, and I mean, that's what they're using them to in Florida for hurricane proof homes, but um, so it's category five, but it could handle like 250 an hour missiles. So I think a two by four at 250 miles an hour that slams up against it. Um, but it also comes with a minimum ballistic rating of, of nine millimeters. So it really is designed to be strong. And my thought was, you know, if you're putting 10, 15 million bucks of servers out there, why would you make it so it's not strong that can kind of be blown over the wind? I think people have just kind of accepted that. Um, but the other benefit of that too is with this composite, it makes it super lightweight. So my previous ones or our previous ones um, were based on concrete. So it's roughly 60 tons for the shell. Now we're down to five or six tons for the shell. So crane costs are cheaper, transportation costs are cheaper, but now you can truly have a portable data center. Just put it on a truck and just keep it on a truck. And the benefit of that too is you don't have to permit or anything. Um, next thing we kind of do want to do, which we've already kind of touched on was this construction or manufacturing approach. Um, but we also want a quick time to deployment. So we actually deploy on peers. So, you know, I'd love to say I'm smart. It's just being robbed from how you deploy ski lifts or most, uh, you know, light poles in, in inside of cities. They don't, they use these helical peers. And so they get screwed into the ground. Um, the benefit is there's no geotech survey. Since you don't land grade, because you don't need to land grade for these, you might not need any civil permanent. It really depends on the local AHJ. Um, but you can install one of these things in a day. Um, but it also, you know, gives you the capability to go on any terrain, raise it at any level. Um, so it's really that quick time to deployment aspect to it. But it's also sustainability where you weren't affecting a local environment. And, you know, we, we've done a lot of work to make this you know, the mechanical units are low DB that we can make aesthetically pleasing. We can kind of make, make do some architectural improvements on the outside to make it fit in, in these residential areas. Um, but it's all, you know, it's all really going after HJs and making quick time deployment. And then the last thing is we have a software layer to control the whole thing. So you can control the mechanical, you can, you know, switch mechanically, you can raise and lower temperatures, you can get all these alerts on your phone or text or whatever. And we have our own knock. It's part of the service. We have our own not 24 seven that will take care of this stuff. Nice. Very nice. And who's buying these? Who, who typically are your customers? Tony? You know, you know, I would say the customers kind of fall in different areas. The first one is these customers that are starting to build this hub hub spoke. And I kind of mentioned it, but also, you know, there's programs out there like B, which is a broadband infrastructure act here in the States where, we're, you know, the, the States are spending 44.25 billion to bring broadband to rural areas. So, you have this first hub, which is your on-ramp peering point. You have the second hub that's this aggregation point, And those are really being in between 100 kilowatts up to five megawatts. And then you have the spoke out. So we're participating in that that second hub and that that spoke out. We're fitting in there. Um, next thing is we're seeing, you know, basically telecoms believe that 5G is the future, like real 5G, not like the fake 5G that we have right here, like true millimeter wave 5G. Um, and that's also private 5G. And so, you know, they can't use the telecom huts they've had in the past, but they also can't, you know, they can't just replace them because that's there are tens of thousands of them out there. So we're starting to see more of that, you know, the, kind of the, the 5G aspect of it. Um, there's people who want local HPC, you know, local you know, HPC racks or GPU racks. Most retail 
even some hyperscale data centers can't handle that. So, you know, why not just put it in the parking lot and and call it good instead of having to go find a spot or, or retrofit their own kind of data center. Of course, there's DOD. Um, you know, DOD really understands, you know, they are going to the cloud, but they also understand that that puts all the eggs in one basket, that a distributed infrastructure is really key in a, any kind of scenario where, you know, they're, they could be going against an enemy and also for, you know, kind of cyber and that kind of stuff. So DOD, and then really it's, anyone with an AV closet because, you know, compute right now, normal standard compute, six to eight kilowatts, which was different than the two to three kilowatts it was designed in the past. So your, your rack number of racks were seeing those AV closets, but also the density of the racks are receiving those AV closets. And so, you know, do you really want to retrofit that AV closet or retrofit that on-prem data center when you can just put something in your parking lot? Because your, your workers are most likely working remote a couple of times a week and just take a couple of parking spots put a, you know, kind of a hyperscale-ish data center on there that's a, you know, tier three, tier four and and call it good. Nice, very nice. Now we were talking off camera about, well, I think you said actually just now that you have the time of your life, but I don't think there's anything, we were talking off camera about nothing being sort of rewarding or and also challenging of of that sort of startup really and, and, and the challenges that we go through. How, what's the journey been like since, you know, since you've been a part yeah. of this? Yeah, and so I would say, you know, my my past, you know, outside the military has definitely been colored by these large tech companies where, you know, I was definitely at that time very technology ops focused. And so, you know, the diamond encrusted thing is fine because the company will pay for that diamond encrusted thing. Um, but when you're trying to build a business, you can't really do that. You know, you kind of have to figure out, you know, what's the business, the business comes first and what sells and what can you quickly get out there? And so it, you have to make in your head, you know, I wouldn't say sacrifices, but compromises to get what you think should be and what the customers are actually kind of going to buy. And so, you know, I walked out going, oh, yeah, this is going to be easy. I know how to do this kind of stuff. And, you know, two years down the road, I'm like, wow, you know, I sure as heck learned a lot. I'm lucky, you know, at least as a incubated startup, um, you know, or, you know, a business under compass, it's been great because I can just say, I have, you know, no shortage of people to sit there and say, okay, I'm an idiot. Uh, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? I don't, you know, I don't, if I was doing this as a regular startup, I would, you could still have people out there you could ask, but they aren't necessarily invested in you like the, you know, an incubated startup. So it's been, it's been a huge learning experience. You know, I honestly thought, and I don't know if it was a little bit of arrogance or just my, because of my time in tech that, you know, oh yeah, this, this doesn't seem too hard, but it is, <laughs> it's all, yeah. you know, it is a lot harder, you know, you have to, don't have you know, kind of shove the ego in the back to to realize that kind of stuff. But it is, but I will say it's rewarding because, you know, what I really wanted to do was I, I was happy building, but I wanted to make my own mark and try something else out and build it from scratch. And that's kind of the path I'm on. And, you know, whether I'm, I fail or the company's super successful, I think I've learned a heck of a lot. And that's what I really wanted to do was learn. Now, Granted, I would love to have tens of thousands of these things and be able to drive past them and say, oh, yeah, that's one of mine kind of things. But, you know, if I don't, then I'm OK with that, too, just because it's, I've, I felt like I learned a lot and I'll be better off in the future from all the lessons that I've had. Yeah, we're in very different industries, but I that resonates with certainly pretty much everything you said there with, with the journey that sort of we've been on as a business as well. So, and, yeah, absolutely. To be honest, you're, you're everything. I mean, you are your finance, your product, your technology and ops, which is you know, my, my safe space, um, your sales, you know, your biz dev. And, you know, some things I've found I've been very, very good at. And some things I suck at, you know, I guess because it's just like, you know, I it's just you, you find it as you go through this, you just start well suited for that kind of stuff. And it might just be, you know, just your nature or anything else. And you can't do everything all at once. So you kind of muddle through it until you can, hire some people, but the problem is that the people who hire today are probably not people you're going to need tomorrow. So how do you balance that and all that kind of stuff? So it's uh, it's been rewarding and super interesting, but also super, a lot harder than I thought it would be. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's definitely an egotistical thing to say, but it is a lot harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I concur. Um, in terms of, uh, before we move on to other things, because I'm, I'm really keen to pick your brains on, on a few other points. Uh, a, a little bit away from uh, Compass Quantum, but what does the next 12 months hold for, for you guys there? 
I mean, I think it's, you know, we have our, you know, 100% composite module, and I think it's just getting these first contracts. And so it's, you know, it's a balance because you could really go out there and advertise to everyone, but there's a danger to that because you could have one person take 100 units. I mean, and there's definitely some bugs and we haven't deployed one yet and we got to work out those processes and everything. You know, we have great GCs and we have straw mans for it and we walk through it. We're still going to learn a lot from that. And so it's it's trying to balance a customer that's definitely going to sign with the amount of customers you have to try to ease your way into it because it, you could really just sink a company by having someone ask for hundreds of them and it, you could, you know, and you mess it all up and everyone thinks you can't do it anymore. So I think it's, you know, those 12 months is delivering to our first kind of customer and then kind of also filling out this HPC and, and some of the stuff we're doing for, you know, that we're starting to do with DOD and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I think it's just finally taking that first step into actually being a, you know, I, you know, like a, it's like Pinocchio, like a real, real person um, or a real company that actually makes money instead of just a cost center. Yeah. Yeah, but look, I, it sounds it sounds great, and, and I know you're enjoying that journey, and I wish you guys uh, the very best of luck, uh, and I'll be watching on um, eagerly to see to see how you guys do. Um, why why you're here? I I know um, from what I've read about you, Tony, before we started speaking, um, I've read a number of different articles. I think, um, and you mentioned sustainability, and you know the wider data center industry is under a lot of pressure for, um, and rightly so, for energy consumption, sustainability. And I think that you're, an, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but you're an advocate for nuclear power within nuclear energy within the data center world, which um, I, I was just keen to really get your your um, your views on that, really. Yeah. And I, so definitely on sustainability and, you know, what it's, it's all a question of matter of when you're going to be forced to do it. I mean, in Europe, they already have green financing. So, you know, every if you borrow and if you're green, then you get a certain rate of borrow compared to a company that's not green. So it definitely affects the pocketbooks, not so much in the States, but you do have a lot of people who have committed to, you know, 20, 30, 20, 40 goals. And so they're going to eventually have to start thinking about sustainability. There's plenty of ways to do that. And just getting the count on that. But I do think, you know, part of this is how do you get power dense power that's relatively cheap, you know, talking, you know, less than a hundred dollars per, you know, kilowatt of power. And so, um, I think it's over that where this might be a megawatt. Don't have to come back on that one uh, on the costing aspect, but, you know, to me, you know, I 21 years or 20 years in the military, I've been operating nuclear since 1996. The Navy has never had a nuclear problem since 1950, you know, birth in 1955, never had a nuclear problem on it. I and mean, I do think, the nuclear industry has some problems where they've had some issues um, where, you know, through my island, Fukushima and Chernobyl, but if actually someone actually sat and explained what actually happened, I think the public would understand more that there's actually a lot of thought and design that goes into these. Those ones are actually admirations um, of stuff that happened. You know, Chernobyl was, op you know, nuclear power is designed to operate at zero and a hundred percent. Um, they disable all their safety features and operate at like 60 or 70% for a test. Not very smart. You know, Fukushima, they had two plants. One plant shut down. The second plant, they've actually could have stopped everything, but they made the choice to not pump seawater inside the reactor because they didn't want to ruin it. Obviously, a great decision. Also, they actually had all their, they took, you know, to save some money, they put their diesel generators right next to the seawall too. And... And then, you know, Three Mile Island was a release of radiation, but I think it, a radioactivity, I do think if someone actually described it, I mean, you're around, you're around this radioactivity all the kind of time and you know, right on to the biggest source, it could be up to 250 millirem per year. I mean, you get actually it's two millirem for every thousand miles that you fly in a plane, um, you know, sleeping next to someone at night, you get roughly to 50 to 60 millirem to give an idea an x-ray is 100 millirem. Um, and on board a submarine, I probably got six to seven millirem a quarter. So, I mean, you can, so you can do it and you can do it right. But the nuclear industry has made the decision that if they don't talk about it, then no one's going to look at them. But the, you know, that worked well in the past. We just had, you know, a couple hundred of them. But now as you try to expand it out, you're going to have to talk to people about it. I mean, look at what Terra Power did in Wyoming. They actually went out there, they had town hall meetings, they answered a bunch of questions 
And in the end, they didn't have any problem building that um, or, you know, going to, you know, make the plans and build that Wyoming. And I think that's what we have to do is just kind of be open. Now, the data center or the nuclear plants in, of now are very, very different than the ones in the past where they have these, something we've always had in the military, but on the submarines, but it's this passive features. It does not require operator action. You can actually walk away from some of these reactors and they will cool itself for months. And it's just the wonders of thermodynamics. Who would have thought that, you know, hot water rises and cold air goes down. You can actually drive, you know, water through your pipes, your pipes like that. So that's kind of what they're trying to take advantage of that. Um, and it's something we've had in submarines for a while. Uh, but it's also, you know, you have this lower density, which is these SMRs, which are trying to look at more manufacturing approach. Um, you also have different kinds of reactors where you still have the light water reactors, but they do suffer a sin. We're at 1,250 degrees. They start melting, making hydrogen, and hydrogen's bad. So they have these other ones that are actually op operate at atmospheric pressure. And this is like the Terra Paramatrium or XL Energy, which is actually uses helium that doesn't boil until 2200 degrees. So it's a very different, we are much farther away from any kind of issues. But then you also have these, these micro reactors, which the best way to think of that is like a battery, no different than a, a double A that you put in something these show up and hook right up to your grid they don't require anything they just show up in an iso container you just hook them up call it good and then when it comes down after you know fiber and these are up to you know 10 megawatt electrical then you take them away and, and you just replace them but i actually think you know if you if you would have asked me a year ago i would have said smrs definitely first and these micro reactor things are silly now i'm like well micro reactors are probably 2026 and everything else is probably 2030 and beyond um because you know the nuclear industry has always had the problem of large-scale construction that's not really done well so a lot of these plants are still large-scale construction plants that even if they're manufacturing the reactor module designs and they come in they still suffer the problems of large-scale construction where a micro reactor is true manufactured um and is just brought to you right now so i do think we're probably gonna get micro reactors first, but that's for kind of smaller stuff. And it might be backup, it might be peak, or it might be in one of these smaller data centers when we don't, we're not going up to 500, 600 megawatts, but then we will have the future of these SMRs mm -hmm. to kind of take it. And I mean, there's definitely ones that are less than 300, but there's also ones like the Rolls Royce was, is doing a, another 500 megawatt reactor, which is totally based on their, their submarine reactor that is said, well, let's just think how big we can make it and, and use that one. So it's not truly an SMR, but it is a Gen 4 design, a Generation 4 reactor design. Yeah. Sorry, what, hopefully that was a long-winded no, answer. It, it's, it's, that, it's the bit of the, the, the towards the beginning of the answer, which I think, and look, when I when I use the words sort of person in the street, that that's me on these matters. I'm not that technical. I'm interested. I'm not that technical, but... It's just kind of winning. I think it's kind of winning hearts and minds a little bit on on that as an energy source. Oh, just just yeah. because, like you say, you know, people just have such opinions of of the word nuclear and and all and all the all the images that we've seen on TV, all all the shows that we've seen, um, documentaries, and, and and I just think it's great created a lot of fear, and, and I understand that, but it, it sounds to me that those in the know it, it's very much a, a you know could well be a long-term solution should well be a long-term solution now granted i am definitely biased because i've operated in you know and i'm actually you know certified by the department of energy to run my own plant that's what you have to do <laughs> to be a ceo of a submarine but um you know i'm that biased but i do see it as an abundant source of power that can be very power dense and provide power cheaply for areas um, we just got to have open conversations about it though, and, and have these kinds of discussions. And, you know, for, there are, you know, there's also been a problem, yeah, also with waste and everything where there are actually plants that are being developed right now. It's, it's obviously, I don't think most people know this, but when you actually put your, your, your fuel inside a reactor on these normal reactors, you actually have about 95% of your fuel still left when it's considered done. And so there's plants being developed that can take that 95% fuel instead of just putting it somewhere that can reuse the rest of this fuel in a different design reactor that's actually specifically designed for that um, to try to use the rest of the fuel. And there's, you know, there's plenty of things other things can do. That, but they are we are taking a lot of uh, pushes in technology or, or research a lot of difference in technology to 
really go after that you know that that few that you know kind of the waste problem and i do think a lot of these design actually build it you know they think about waste you know they they store internally right there inside the plant and inside the containment or they just approach it different ways for different designs but they are actively thinking about how to minimize it as opposed to what it's going to generate it no matter what yeah okay excellent um there's something else close to your heart. You are the veterans chair, I believe, for the infrastructure masons, um, an ex-serviceman transitioning into new industries. I try and steal five or 10 minutes of people's time on each episode to talk about kind of the skills gap. Um, now, yeah. I know that's something close to your heart. And um, so, first of all, please please give us some insight on, on what you do as, as the veterans chair, really, within the infrastructure masons. Yeah, but it's it's really working with the tech companies to try to develop ways to get more service members into the tech field. And it's not necessarily just data centers. It could be, I mean, there's plenty of people out there who are good at networking or software, program, project management, to, and to actually get them in the tech field, but help them bridge that gap and give them, you know, kind of an advantage. Because the problem that we I think we have with a lot of hiring is, I mean, we even develop programs for it where we scour these CVs or resumes and look for those skills that we think we need. But in the end, that's just giving you something with the experience that you have. It doesn't tell you the person. And I think what the veterans bring, they may not have the skills that you have, or a lot of experience with the skills, but they've probably done something better or something a little bit different but military, every two years, you're transferred, so you learn a new job. You know, you've been starting with leadership since day one. Um, you work well under pressure. And let's be honest, no one gets paid in the military very much. And so people do it because, you know, they, it's some, they believe in something greater than themselves. And so those kind of people, I think, what the military bring you is, it's, it brings you this, this will and this dedication, and you can't, you can't teach, I mean, you, you can't hire for that. I mean, it's just one of those things that is ingrained into people and you either have it or you don't. And that's not something you can teach. Um, I think you can teach anything else. And so maybe you have to take two vets instead of one and as you can grow them up, but I think six months down the road, you're going to be better off for that kind of, that kind of hire. But I think most vets, most people look at vets and think they can just shoot guns or, or do operations, but they've, you know, I've been on, you know, let's look at the submarine force because that's what I'm used to. We've been on, you know, some of these retrofits that have hundreds of thousands of line items. So you're doing something more, much more complex than a traditional construction build. Um, you're you're very good at doing maintenance. So you do it, you know, kind of critical maintenance, commissioning, you know, you name it. Most, most military vets have done it. They just don't know they've done it and they need help to, to try to bridge that gap to align the skills and you know, we need help from the industry to understand that and take a chance on them. And I do think, you know, people complain all the time about they can't get good talent. And I really do think it's because they're looking in the wrong places. They're not hire, they're hiring for the resume or CV for experience instead of hiring for that whole, that person that, that, you know, that has that culture, that work ethic. Um, and that's what I think that's bring to the table. Um, yeah. And, you know, you'd be better off. Yeah, I, I still really do think that and believe that you're going to be better off is a company six months down the road, it's just going to take a little more work on the front end for you to get them going. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think the skills shortage, the skills gap isn't, is only going to get worse. And certainly you know, the whole explosion of AI seems to be driving more and more demand for people. Um, and, and I want, I always want these episodes to be positive towards this industry. And I know there's a number of businesses that do really great things in in bringing people from outside of the industry and, and giving them a shot, essentially, what what more could the industry? How much more does the industry have to to do, given what we know is going to be ahead of us in the next sort of three or four years, and and beyond that, of course. I mean, I think it's you know, if I look at, let me talk that aspect of it. I think the vet, you know, the the industry needs to help vets find jobs, but somewhat be agnostic about what company they're going to find a job for. So let's say you have an executive fellowship or whatever, and you bring people in, um, you need to help them find a job. What if they're not in your company? You should be okay with them going to a different company and helping them that bridge that gap. And so I think it's companies just should be helping people out for the sake of helping people out, not trying to, you know, tr almost treat us like, 
little chip. So I got a hundred vets, you know, I, I feel like I met my goal kind of thing. That's not the way we should treat it. it should be really be for, you know, helping these people who put their life on the line for an almost no pay. I mean, there's the army, U S army actually told people who could not eat, go get food stamps. I mean, these are people that still stay in the military because they believe it's something to self and their, their big boss tells them to go get food stamps. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I think we should go out of our way to kind of help them. And so that's why I think the technology community needs to really change their mentality on how they're hiring and and help people out to find jobs, no matter kind of where it's at. Um, I also think, you know, we as a community really focus a lot on the officer aspect to it. Um, and there's this large group of enlisted that could do a great job just as much. And we need to continue focusing on that. Let's be honest, for most of these jobs, did your college degree ever help you for any of the things you're doing right now? And I would say your college is good for, you know, getting you to think a little bit different and think broader. And I think, you know, five, 10 years in the military is going to tell you to do that anyway. So, I mean, you're really getting what you want out of that college degree through the time in the military. So stop, you know, looking for these, making prerequisites for these college degrees. It's just, you aren't using it at all. You're really using what it's, what the college, you know, that college experience gives someone. So I think it's opening up the aperture more to really understand what you really want and what you're hiring for um, and just take a chance on them. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone wants to get involved, anyone listening to this that wants to support what you'll do with the infrastructure missions, who should they reach out to? Yourself, Tony? Is there yeah, just, anybody yeah, else? Reach out to myself. I'll, you know, point you in the right direction. But we're also have working with a lot of other companies if you're interested in and we're happy to help you out, whether you're hiring, we're happy to put you in touch with a bunch of veterans, or if you're a veteran and you're looking for some some camaraderie, that that team that you're probably missing a little bit, missing post-military, um, we're also happy to do that where we can have, kind of have a fellowship. And, you know, as people, and, and that's the one thing you really do miss from the military is just, you know, you are definitely in the one team where everyone has your back and, and you, you know, you, you grow up, you know, you, you eat together you sleep together and it really has that bonding experience you just don't necessarily get that as much hmm. in the outside world and so i think people are looking for that you know ex are looking for that too so you know we're, we're happy to provide that fellowship we want to provide that fellowship and look out for each other no excellent um yeah really really good uh initiative to be involved in and also a couple of questions finally for me um i always want to put the digital infrastructure world in 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 the best light i think it's um an industry that by design is largely invisible to a lot of people if you're not in it. Uh, a lot of people have fell into it. A lot of amazing people and, and industry leaders have fallen into it. What is the, for someone out there thinking, oh, you know, it, sound, it sounds good. What, what's the best aspect of having a career in the, why would someone get into it, would you say? I don't, I mean, it's, it's the, it's something that is never, at least in, in my eyes, is never going to have an end. There's always going to be a desire for infrastructure and even if there's, you've built the infrastructure, there's always going to be different infrastructure. I mean, look at HPC to standard compute is a great example. And H HPC, I'm you know, kind of lumping with GPU where, you know, standard compute six to eight kilowatts and now you're 50 to 60 kilowatts. So they can't, you know, a six to eight kilowatts can't support to 50 to 60 kilowatts. So you're going to have to build new infrastructure. So as technology evolves, you're always going to have to be tweaking the infrastructure that you have or developing new infrastructure to support it. So it's a job that's going to keep on giving. So once you get into the industry, it's just going to be, it's, you're never going to be built it and call it good. It's just not like that. It's always changing. It's always going to faster pace. Um, and you're going to have to retrofit or build new. And so it's it's just one of those things that I look at when I look outside. And I have, I have friends on the outside who are doing outside of infrastructure and outside tech. And, you know, they're hard. You know, a lot of people are getting laid off and they have, have problems finding jobs. And it's just because, see, they hit that point where there's no real push past that point where the, you know, the, that community or that sector has kind of reached the maximum um, of what they're trying to do and, and not really expanding or changing their technology where the tech sector or the infrastructure is always changing and always developing. So it's, it's never going to get completed just from the fact we're always inventing new stuff. So, you know, what's different tomorrow is going to be different than today. And so you're always going to have it. I mean, you can always feel like you're always going to have a job because there's always going to be something to change or, or work on. Yeah, certainly uh, an exciting, fast-paced place to, to apply your trade. However, if, if you hadn't have found your way within it, post sort of service services, what, what do you think you would be, my final question, what would you be doing? That's a good question. I don't, If I wasn't 
doing that. I, to be honest, I might be sitting in some nuclear plant right now being a shift leader, uh, or I, I would be in the defense industry. Um, and so, but I think, you know, that's like, it's not, it's kind of like the death sentence a little bit for these people leaving the military because you're just effectively going from one military to another military that doesn't value, doesn't always value, you know, creativity. And it's just really to serve the defense industry. Um, you know, and I, th I have my own feelings about that, but I do think um, that's where I'd be at right now, kind of doing one of those things, you know, leading retrofits on submarines. I don't, I don't know, but some, somewhere in there, I probably would have been, and I wouldn't have been able to scratch this itch in the tech or, or challenge things or grown up. I wouldn't have, I definitely wouldn't have grown or as a person or a, as a leader or as a technology you know, a person, I just, I would have been stagnant is probably the best way to say it. and continuing doing, you know, it's almost making big rocks into little rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Tony, um, thank you so much for your time uh, today. Thank and you. also just, just, you know, really wish you the best of luck with everything you're doing at Compass Quantum Sense. You've got a really exciting time ahead uh, and good luck with all the great work you're doing with the Infrastructure Masons as the veterans chair and, and all the other things that you're doing as the social media influencer that you are uh, with all things. Really that well. In fact, my, my, my kids still don't be out there. Yes. They, they have to disagree with that. <laughs> they would disagree they with that completely. They don't, they're not, they don't realize you're the Kim Kardashian of the data center world. I am no. definitely not the Kim Kardashian of the data center industry. There's plenty of other people, you know, Nancy Novak, the climate, all those people are definitely more than me. I just, uh, I think it's fun to have these kind of discussions on LinkedIn and, and to challenge the status quo and, and poke at it. I mean, but that is, that is a nuke in me where it's just like, it's the, the, the poking <laughs> really, yeah. really well, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into that. Yeah. I, I think that there's, there's a number of prominent people on LinkedIn. I, I'd love to see more as well and people to have the confidence to, to create content, to put the industry in, in the place it, it really should be. I um, think it's got a long way to go to, to really highlight to again me the average person in the street um but um yeah keep up the great work oh, and i've learned a lot on there too I, i've actually reassessed some of the beliefs that i've had on on the ways ahead but like i never knew that you know it's in the that's the great thing about linkedin it's really all people around the world all cultures that you can you know really that will that will challenge you and i think with an open mind you will learn a lot on linkedin so to me it's not just a a way to get further in your career, understand what's going on. It's a way to, you know, grow and, and both yourself and the industry some more if you're, if you're opening yourself up to it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. On that note, thank you again, Tony. Um, all the best. Thanks for, Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All the best.